All right. So uh, this week we're going over chapter six, which is uh, parsing expressions. Because uh, so last chapter, so two chapters ago, we made our lexer right to build up the tokens, and then we had to do like a little bit of an aside last chapter to figure out how we're going to represent expressions. And now today we're going to be uh, parsing it. So um, let's see what we talk about here. Yeah, just saying what we've done so far. Um, so here he, uh, we revisit something that was brought up, I think, in the last chapter with ambiguous uh, expressions or an ambiguous grammar. Because uh, this is what we came up with last chapter. And he goes over this thing where it's like, you know, if you have a string like this, what order do you do the division and the subtraction? Because, of course, in math, we all learn, well, you would do this first. But then the question is, well, why would you do this first? instead of that, because ignoring what you already know about math and just reading purely this, it's not obvious. Like you could, um, he, you know, he talks about how you can like generate rules and you can generate this rule either way. So just from, just from this grammar that we developed, it's not obvious how to, or it's not, it's, it's ambiguous how to parse this because you could either put your mental parentheses around the six and the three or the mental parentheses around the three and the one. So, um, and because, you know, you can go through this, through this thing here where, so let's see, if you start an expression, so we're going to pick a binary expression and the first value is going to be, so binary, and then we're going to pick another expression. And this expression will be the literal number six, right? And then of course, the operator is going to be the division. Right. And the right-hand operator will be the uh, will be another binary expression that, and in this case, um, uh, the expression will be the or the binary operator will be the expression. We have the three and the one, and we subtract them. So these are the different syntax trees you can come up with, and obviously they give you different results. So then we talk about precedence and associativity, which is the tools you need to like make this kind of thing unambiguous, right? So precedence tells you how strongly things bind to each other, right? So in this case, if we we're going to be mathematically correct, we would say that the division binds more strongly than the uh, minus. And then also the associativity, uh, this tells us, um, so all we need is precedence for this example, but then for associativity, this tells us when two things have the same precedence, the order that you do things in. So in math, we it's left to right, but he gives an example of assignment where it's actually you go right to left, right? So essentially all precedence and associativity tell you is just where to put the mental, the rules for putting the mental parentheses around things. Um, yeah. So here are the examples of how it associates with each other. And then we do this cool trick here where um, essentially we create a separate rule. And again, rules are just things that generate, uh, I forget, uh, but rules are things that generate, uh, there's a fancy name for it that starts with P. I forget what it is. But so we just go through these. By the way, if anyone has any thoughts on this, free, feel free to, you know, I'm just trying to summarize the chapter and then we can get into the specifics of what. Uh, we learn so please interrupt but so we create a rule for each precedence level and it's this was cool for me to think about because you sort of go from the from the least precise to the most precise thing and the reason that we have to do this is because as we go down we need to we need to make things uh left not left associative but uh essentially where is that? So here, when we come up with rules like this, right, we start from the least specific thing. So that way, as we go down the levels, so we'll start on the left-hand side, right? And then we can sort of wrap the parentheses around each of these beginning things. So you would think you would start from like the, the most specific, but you do it the other way around. Because that way, each of these rules can include the more specific one in that on the left-hand side. Um, so the, the trick we're going to use for this is recursive descent parsing, which is probably the most popular way of 
uh, parsing things. Uh, it's a top-down parser. Uh, I, I like this uh, note that he makes here about how we mix up our metaphors a little bit because like Philly, when we're defining this here, the, the very top of the thing here has the lowest precedence. And then we go down to the things that have the most precedence, right? But for the, um, but when we talk about like the recursive descent, it's the, we use the opposite metaphor for like high and low, right? So it's, uh, you know, when talking about sub expression, so I didn't even notice this when I was reading it, but it's like, it, it wasn't until I read this that I realized that it was confusing. Uh, and then we make some code for the parser, blah, blah, blah. Pretty straightforward. Um, uh, obviously, for the uh, for expressions, pretty straightforward. And for equality, um, we use this trick where we have a match thing that will just tell us what the next um, what the next token is, and then we rewind and we uh, we just apply this pattern to all the different binary operators, uh, where we you know we have this mutable variable here, and then we just each time uh, we go through this loop. We make a binary expression where we put the new expert on the left hand side. Again, we need this trick and this trick here. That's how we make everything, you know, that's how we put everything on the left. So as we recurse down, we won't go down uh, infinitely, infinitely far. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, so we just implement Matt. It's pretty much what I said. Something that I thought was weird was, um, I, I felt like instead of having to like check the, instead of doing this match and then checking the previous, it would make more sense if like match return the previous or something like that. I don't know. I, I think that this pattern is weird of always saying previous. Um, but yeah, we implement the check thing, advance. This is all pretty straightforward. Um, I, I love these drawings that he does throughout the, the sections. Uh, what else we got? Again, this is going to be the same as the last one, except the match on a few more things. This is also going to be the same. Uh, this is also the same. Unary is even easier than the other ones because we just um, uh, because we just have the right hand side here, so that's nice. Let's see, and then we get to the to this one, which this one is also really simple. It's just a lot of code. Or a lot of code. It's like whatever that is, eight lines. Um. So yeah, this was also pretty straightforward. It's the same pattern that we've been using everywhere. Oh, also the little mix up here is that now we are accounting for an error, right? Because if we match a left paren, then we have to keep going until we reach a right paren. Otherwise, we have some error. And I really like this section. This was probably my favorite section in the chapter. Yeah, this one. Uh, the um the recursive descent parser that was pretty straightforward but i like the syntax error section just from um he talks about a lot of the trade-offs and things to keep in mind when designing parsers which i really like um he talks about the two jobs of a parser you know obviously the first job which most people or where many people may think it's the only job which is just take a sequence of tokens and then get the ast but just well what's also really important for parsers is to create good error messages and to not to not run code that's invalid so uh so that comes into two halves right the first one is just to detect and report the error and then the other one is to avoid crashing or hanging right the whatever we pass to the interpreter has to be a valid ast so it's critical that our parser doesn't um doesn't send malform code to the uh interpreter and then so these are the most important ones and then there's other things here too like uh you know being fast this is nice uh and then we have these things where we're reporting as many distinct errors as there are and then to minimize cascaded errors these come in conflict right because if you report a lot of errors or if you instead of just reporting the single error where uh, you know, you had a parsing problem. You want to be able to report more errors than that in the file. 
And so that way programmers can help fix like uh, one problem and then there's another one and et cetera, et cetera. But the other thing is that when you find malformed code, it may trick you into thinking that there's tons of errors throughout the rest of the, the file. So you have to, so these things come into, um, come into conflict. So finding the right balance is important. Uh, I actually don't think he gave a, he didn't give a great explanation for how you should balance these, but I think it's largely up to opinion. You can't do it perfectly, but the way that we do it in this section is through what he calls the panic mode error recovery. So I think that's a decent way to do it, which is simply that when you find, uh, when you find a parsing error, you just immediately, uh, you try to go up all the levels in your parsing stack until you reach like whatever the top level thing is, like a statement, which is what we do. And this is actually what makes, uh, which makes the decision to use semicolons to separate statements really nice. Because the plan here is essentially that when we detect a parsing error, like for example, uh, a syntax error like this, where someone, there's a left paren, but no closing right paren, we just, um, we can just skip until the next semicolon, right? And then continue going on from there. Uh, so again, we write uh, some helper code that we need to do this. And we actually, we end up using exceptions here, which I think is interesting. At first, I didn't like the idea of throwing errors in the, in the parser, just from like a, a design perspective, you know, I'd rather like return the error, but he gives a good justification for why we should throw instead of returning the error, which is that the idea of throwing is that it lets you, uh, it lets you skip all the way up the, the, the call stack because the way that we've implemented our parser with all these different functions is that each stage of the parser or each, uh, each expression that we're trying to parse or each rule that we're trying to parse is its own stack frame. So by using an exception, you can like skip all the way up to wherever you want to catch it, which in this case we can catch at the statement level. Um, so we talk about how we're going to do this, right? So essentially we don't only stop at a semicolon if it's, um, so we'll either stop at when we reach a semicolon or if it looks like someone's trying to, you know, create a new function or something. Um, but since we don't actually have statements yet, this code uh, won't work. Uh, and then we wire the, uh, so now we wire the parser up to our main, you know, to our locks thing. So yeah, we do that. We hook it up to our main method here. And uh, that's it. Yay. So uh, what did you guys think of the chapter? I think it's pretty nice. I, I really like that, uh, like the trade-off of error. Yeah, you're talking about um, the trade-off between reporting many distinct errors to minimize false positives. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I agree. Because I've had, I've seen, I've encountered compilers with both of these problems before, you know? Like it's definitely, you run into this thing where your compiler reports an error and then you fix that error and then there's like another error and you have to keep going. And then that's not great either. It would be nice if we could just tell you all the problems up front. But then I've also had it happen, especially in like C++, you know, where you have like one syntax error and it just, you get a hundred, you know, different errors. And it's like, but it's all actually just one problem. And you got to like figure out where's that. I, I, I would say that, it's way more important to minimize false positives than it is to minimize false negatives because it's really tough when your compiler gives you like a hundred errors and you have to find which of those errors is the actual error that like will fix all the other errors. I think for like for something like type error probably, but for parsing it's like, 
no, now this our workflow is a little bit different because a lot of times we use IDEs like mm -hmm. and like things like language servers. And yes, so excellent. we probably yeah want to just fix this line first rather than first fix the, that the line above that. So I guess it it is so that's why it's like both are important. Well, no, I mean ideally we would just have <laughs> we would have all the true positives and none of the negatives, right? But um but it's not but it's, it's not yeah even. it's hard problem because like it's it's even different from type checking because parsing when we have a parse error that means we just have a broken program and right we have no idea what's going on yeah yeah depending on the kind of thing it's you can have like sometimes you can guess right uh we talk about this a lot in uh error productions i didn't know this is the specific name for it but this is something that it's um, so this is a technique where you, where certain rules that are forbidden by the grammar, you actually expand the grammar to allow these kinds of things. So that way you can parse them and give better error messages. Um, and I think that's a common, I think that's really cool to like, to make things a bit more, um, like to make certain rules more broad. So that way you can catch specific kinds of common errors that you know people will do. Um, there's like, that's one of the reasons that I really like result builders in Swift because they allow you to, to do that as well. And so tools like Swift UI, the, the Swift UI parser, if you look at the actual grammar for Swift UI, it allows certain kinds of syntax that are actually forbidden but in order to give you better error messages they they allow them in the grammar and i think that's really nice i wish we could have this kinds of things for for other kinds of things in programs right to like custom error messages i think about this a lot in like type systems because in if you're in any type programming language if you have a function that accepts like a certain type and then someone tries to call it with the wrong kind of type, then that's, you know, that's just immediately a compilation error and that's it. But it's too bad that you can't make it, that you that you can't build like custom error messages and that kind of thing, you know? Like if someone's trying I think, to- ask, I think uh, like if you are following the development of Rust, for example, I think they are doing a lot of interesting stuff with that. It's, well, it's not that just- but like, for example, in Rust, if, well, okay, you can do something like that, but it's built into the compiler, right? Like if something takes a stir, but you pass it like a string or a vec of U8 or something, I don't know if the compiler tells you like, hey, you know, uh, you pass a string, but this you wanted a, a vec of U8, you can just call this method and then convert it. I don't know if Rust does that, but even if it does, that's built into the compiler, right? I don't think that yeah, it's like, it's it, uh, the compiler definitely do a lot of like uh, customized hint right rather than just like apply the type in, type inverse algorithm and you meet an error that's it and that's why like a lot of those languages uh, like with like bidirectional type inference doesn't have very good error messages and Rust tries really hard. Yeah, but as a programmer, I can't do that. Like, unless, um, but yeah, so as a programmer, if I'm writing an API, I can't, I can't do that unless I change my types to like allow them to be more. Like in this weird example, if I like let my types be either, either a string or a vec of U8, so that way if someone passes me a vec of U8, I like, you know, give them like a runtime error saying that like, oh you should call this method to change it but that's weird right yeah oh i i see i see what you're going yeah yeah like that's i want that as a programmer idea. i think the rust compiler has that right but if as a programmer i would when i'm writing my my libraries it would be cool if i could do things like error productions in the type system which is like catching mistakes that i know people will make and then 
so I can give them a custom error message. So you can see plus plus and then put the brain in string, which is you can do something that is balanced like that. Please excuse Sorry, it's hard to hear you. Can you try to fix your mic? Okay. <laughs> it's so hard to hear you. I don't know. Is is anybody able to uh is anyone able to parse that? Can someone uh, nope. <laughs> can someone send me that AST in chat? All right. Um, but anyways, I think it's I think it's a cool it's a cool feature I would like. And Swift gives that to you with result builders, you know. Like you can do that because well, with result builders, you are building a syntax. And I think you could probably do that in Rust with macros as well. Um yeah, I just think I, I like that idea. And I think the Rust compiler has that built in, but they don't give that ability to programmers. Can, can you hear me better now? Oh, way better. Okay, wonderful. So I think in most languages, you can get something similar. The user experience is not great, but for example, in C++, you can uh, use static set and craft your types in a special way. That oh, great. Right only trigger in those yeah. scenarios. That's a great point. Yeah, static assert is exactly that, right? Well, but is it? No, 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 because static assert, that wouldn't do, because if I wanted to a static assert thing, then I would have to broaden my function's type definition to allow for types that I don't want, and then use a static assert to make it a thing that I really do want. I guess that's what you do with error productions too, though, right? You make like the interface broader, but then inside the actual implementation, you yes. have like a static. Assert. So then in that case, I guess you're right. That is, that is pretty much this kind of thing, you know? It's actually, well, because CFFS templates are like, it, it can accept anything. So it, it just works very well with static assert. That's true. Yeah. So you could do that. But then, right, yeah, you could do that with static assert. So I guess static assert with like templates and C++ do kind of allow you to do that. Yeah, but also also like C++ have this idea of spinny friendly. So a lot of times you don't want hard error. You want just, if you pass a run type, this function just doesn't exist at all. Yeah. So it's, there are a bunch of nuance on this kind of topics. Right. right. That's a good point. Yeah, I think static assert does do that, um, at least in C++. But like, I, I'm just saying the idea, I like the idea of if you have some kind of interface with rules associated with it, the ability to catch common mistakes with using that interface and then give them a specific error message to be like, oh, you probably meant to do this instead, right? This is a tool that like compilers have, but I I guess you could also do that in like your your code itself, at least in C++ with static assert. So, yep. Um, let's see, what else was cool? Uh, what's the thing you mentioned earlier? That side note about uh, just the terminology. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Oh yeah, the up and down confusion. Yeah, I think side note is one of the best thing about <laughs> yeah, yeah. these books. Yeah, the side notes and like the the footers. Um, by the way, the footer was a banger in this chapter too. So yeah, I, so what did, what did you think about this? What, what in particular did you like about this side note? It's, it's, well, it's just something that I'd never realized before. It's like, <laughs> we have this opposite and this kind of confusion do like they they does 
well, will cause confusion when actually when we actually code this stuff if we don't realize there is this kind of yeah. upside down. Yeah, and then there's more. He brings up uh, like where the stack rows or trees have their roots at the top. It's yeah. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> like just we uh, yeah. are all too familiar with it. <laughs> yeah, but at least these aren't like inconsistent. You know, like a stack, like a stack growing from bottom up. You know, at least you don't have any like top down analogies inside your stack. I think I don't know. Unless you're talking about a call stack. Oh, that grows downward in memory. Yes, you're right. You're right. Okay, never mind. Yeah, all right. It's all a mess. It's a disaster. It actually doesn't matter. I, I I read a research paper before. Like people don't have understanding problem. Like whatever direction they draw the stack is the same. Yeah, yeah, but there's a convention, and the convention is you know based on history and the layout of memory and whatever. Um. So speaking of footers, the footer in this chapter was pretty cool. Um, talking about logic versus history. So essentially, there's probably just a mistake in C where the bitwise operators bind different um bind more weakly than the comparison operator, so that something like this doesn't work in C, which by the way, you use this this sort of pattern you do all the time in C, right? Um, where you binary or uh, or binary or and masks to you know build up certain kind of flags. So you have to do this and see, but it doesn't really make sense for this for and to have lower precedence than equals because you would never like like it never really makes sense to want to and something with true, you know. I mean, you can and things with one, but. Uh, you know, that's that's more C for you. But like it, it might make sense to someone or something with, with one, but not with true. So it, it this having this bind together doesn't really make sense. So in this footnote we're talking about, so in locks, which doesn't have these binary operators, but let's pretend that they did, then how would we want to do it? Right. You'd think, well, we'd want to fix C's mistake and have these bind together, but then people using your language would be less familiar with it uh i actually think like this is a bad example because like i don't see how that's how that's true at all because this will still work you know it's just anyways but i can definitely see this for other kinds of things so he just talks about when you're designing a language you need to trade these things off because you want people to use your language and you want it to be easy to adopt so you want to make it so you want to make the barrier to entry as little as low as possible to other people right but you can't make the barrier to entry zero because if it's zero, then that means there's nothing to learn from your language, which means that your language isn't doing anything special, right? So instead, what he advises you to do when you create a language is to, you know, you want to use your innovation tokens wisely. So you want to only change the, you only want to break previous patterns where you think it'll give the most value and where it's most important. And then to try to not change other things as much so that people will try your language. Yeah, now, speaking about like the precedence, I think he mentioned like some, you know, we, we usually, most languages have a like precedence table from top to down with different levels. Right. But he mentioned like some languages actually have certain operators that don't have precedence and yeah. doesn't have associativity with each other and uh, I actually think we we have a like coming back of this I, I have uh so the carbon language I find their design in their design they have this interesting idea of like just not all operators have uh precedence which is each other and I find it's actually pretty good just like if a behavior is unnatural it's like it's just don't compile carbon? and add parentheses. What's an example in carbon? Uh, I I sent it in the chat. All right. Oh wait, this is the other thing. Sorry. Oh. 
Oh, okay, Doki. Um, so non-associative. So what's an example of something that's non-associative? Um, let me, can I search for non? There's only one example, or there's no examples here. Um, yeah, there are no example. It's just this idea of like operators can be non associative. So, yeah, so you, you can't mix and and all, for example. You can't say X and Y or C and expand. Oh, to right. Like, like so, that's case. an example, right? And and or could be non associative to force you to, um, to force you to wrap those things. Yeah. Right. Except and and or on their own should be associated with themselves, but not just associated with each other, right? Like there's nothing wrong with having a bunch of ands. Yeah, but... yeah. A and A and B and C is yeah, totally fine. A and B or C is like right. Whatever the precedence you decide is unnatural, it just doesn't make sense. But then why not just have it be the same? Because what happens in in most languages, I think, is that if something is like, yeah, it's, it's not obviously which a, way to do it in. Yeah, yeah you just go left to right. And I think that convention makes sense. You know, if it's A and B or C, you know, then it's like A and B or C, you know. Well, isn't it pretty standard for and to be like multiplication and or to be like addition, right? And, uh, like at least in electronics, right? In digital stuff. So, oh, so you're saying and should just have a higher and uh, is basically uh, multiplication. I mean, it follows yeah. the same rules. It okay. distributes the same way and all that. So sure. Yeah, oh, I feel, I feel like this is probably not natural for every programmer. Yeah. But I think a lot of these things is like if you make a mistake, you get bit by it once, and then you then you know it. Or if you get bit by it a couple of times, then you know it, and then it's not not a big deal anymore. Yeah. So then, all the more reason to just not care and just have it be left to right. You know. Well, left to right is kind of. But in a way, if you switch oh, you the get bit by it once, and then you don't worry yeah. about it. Anymore. Yeah. So I think either it matters or it doesn't. Um, yeah. I think having and. Combined more than or I think that actually does make sense from like a logic perspective but like in the real world if you're going to make a programming language and do that as we talk about at the bottom would that just be more confusing than it's worth you know and you just get a lot of bug reports and you're like or people complain about it because they're used to um, you know like chaining ands and chaining ors together in a certain way mm -hmm. you know yeah, it seems like the big problem with the if statement thing is because Booleans are integers, right? They don't have a Boolean type in C. That's like the big problem. Otherwise, you just get a type error on the first line. Yeah, correct. Correct. Yes, I'm sure. I haven't had this bug before, but I'm sure many people. I probably have. I just don't remember it. Um, yeah, but this is something that like a linter could definitely do. Like uh something like clang tidy. I wonder if clang tidy would uh would warn with this, you know. Just like with anything, like you know, using the result of any quality operation in like something unnatural. Yeah. I don't know. I don't I am on Windows right now, so I don't have LVM on here, but it would be cool if someone tried that out and reported back if uh that's a warning or not. Um, I wonder if having not yeah, I to I want spent a, a good week debugging something that turned out to be this exact <laughs> problem. Yeah. yeah. So I'm guessing in your language, you you are making a bind this way. That's a that's your first move. Yeah. Well, that was that was uh, some C working on a on a JVM. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I mean, I definitely agree. This is more more logical. And yeah, with the type, like the types make it worse. Because if you had different types for Boolean and integer, you would get this error, right? And then it would be like, like this would be a compilation error. But then when you get this compilation error, it's like, 
then you think that's stupid. Why does it, why does it bind this way? If this is impossible anyways, then like just make it bind like this, right? So it's like, I think this is just making it bind this way automatically. It's just the obvious thing, right? Because it's types and then you just, you're just making things harder for people, right? Like, like you clearly know that people can make this mistake. So, but then you're not just fixing it in an easier way, but whatever. Yeah, but you could be doing something else like uh, flag, flag, mag, flag mask equals some flag and, you know, foo equals bar and X equals Y, right? And then. Wait, when you say and, are you saying this and like, or and and? What? Like the and for Booleans, right? So I think the double, what is it in C? It's like it's a double ampersand, right? Yeah. For so you're suggesting uh, something like, I don't, I don't know, I need to place it. Well, I mean, I guess, I mean, like the problem is actually because they're like, if you want to do Boolean and you should be using double ampersand, right? And not a single yeah, ampersand. But you're saying if you have something like this, like and, and what were you, what were you saying? <laughs> Just whatever, foo equals bar, doesn't matter. Just, and then like, so in this, and then give her the front part, right? Like yeah. uh, flags and like, so it's like kind this? of like, I mean, this is how you would normally write that, right? And that makes sense. Flag and in this mask. case, double right. equals has a higher precedence than double ampersand. Um, so I guess, right. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, like, since they have two different operators, maybe it does make sense to do it the way you're saying. Yeah, but then maybe it's inconsistent then if and, because like, especially in C, right? Because and 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 and, they're not called like logical and and binary and. In C, they're just called like the short circuit version of it, right? Because actually, if you look at what and and, like, in C, the idea is that, you know, let's say we have like a nested thing of these and ands the first time we hit something that's true, then we return that, right? Well, if you have something like a single and, then right. it will it will go through the rest of the things in the chain. It won't stop until then. Right. Um, yeah, so I mean, it really does seem in this case, it's like it, it, it should give you a type error because you're using the wrong ampersand. Or yeah. I mean, you're using the the masking and versus the logical and. Mm -hmm. I, I, but I feel like a lot of time we use the masking is because because we yeah we want to do bitwise operations like this mask right. is a kind of bit field so that's why we're using the single ampersand mm -hmm. here. Yep. So on that yeah you're right I think you're right in that case that that single ampersand should have higher precedence than double equals. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because also, yeah, but it is interesting. I hadn't considered this kind of thing. I feel like the author should have uh, brought this up. This is a that's a really good point. Um, yeah, language design is hard. <laughs> it's yeah, hard. it's like because this way, yeah. Let's just say, or for the sake of, let's just say we put the print in the right place. Then, if equality bound was less than let's say double ampersand then you would have or yeah then you would have this and and foo whether this is equal to bar which is also weird right so yeah i guess you would want to have them bind differently right but then it's like it's inconsistent between the short circuit and the uh well, the short circuit and the not short circuit version of and. So yeah, that's a that's a good point. Uh, you also shared this link. I didn't look at this. Uh, error covers parser combinators. Uh oh, are we gonna have Haskell in here? No, it's just Rust. Okay. Yeah, it's Rust. That's why yeah, it's super Rust. close. But but yeah. you know, I think the idea yeah, is Haskell, like, I really so like this uh, article. It's like it just talk about a lot of common problems we meet on um, like error reporting in general. Yeah. yeah. Right. I'm not gonna read this whole thing, but what are we doing? We have a partial thing, right? Okay. 
because it's like a partial of some kind of expression. Uh, yeah, so you can do this in Rust, which I think is cool. You know, it's only like Scala or Haskell. They give you a lot more syntactic sugar for this kind of stuff. You you can do parser combinator in any languages, but it's just like yeah, but both city is different. Um yeah, in the language it gives you different abstractions to like make this kind of thing is standard. Um yeah, that's cool. Um what other things were Cool. Let's see. Okay, so someone asked in the chat about um so parsing is a case where using exceptions for control flow makes sense. I still don't personally know if I would do. Well, first of all, you don't need to throw, right? Because like if you're in Rust or something, you can have the same kind of effect with just like the the question mark operator, you know? Like you just use results and then use question mark, which is like I mean, that's that's isomorphic to throwing, right? If you put question marks everywhere and then one place you don't put a question mark, that's the same thing as as like throwing and then not catching in any method until you get to the, until you catch in a certain place. So it's not necessarily throwing, but, um, but yeah, the idea just being that you want to, that you have all of these call frames and then you want to, you want to skip a bunch of them and you want to skip up to the top. And of course, in Java, exceptions are kind of designed to do that. You know, it just lets you jump out of a function and you jump all the way up to a certain point. So, um, yeah. I think proponents of exceptions often use parsing as yellow. I didn't know that. I've, I haven't heard proponents of exceptions. So that's, that's first. Yeah. Some, sometimes, well, uh... Usually, usually it's in the C++ community, like because people have fierce opinion about this. So, right. <laughs> oh. I can hear about this. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I mean, but again, as I was saying before, there's ways that are like the same as exceptions, but like not, but are more like type friendly or something, right? So, in Rust, which is mostly built on like syntactic sugar, right? So Rust, you do have the you can use results and question mark, which acts the same as as a as a throw except it's a little bit different because if you think of it i'm just thinking about this now so i could be wrong but if you think about who's responsible for what in in java if you throw an exception you have to go out of your way to remember to catch it right so if you if you throw in some function and you think of each each call frame above or each stack frame uh on top of that function then it is that function's responsibility to like try catch it in order for them to get that error in there. But in Rust, it's the other way around where, because, so because back in Java, right? By default, it will just continue going up the chain, right? It'll go up the chain by default. And then you have to go out of your way to like try catch it. But in Rust or in Scala or in Haskell, it's the other way around. Where because Scala and Haskell also have uh like uh result types. Um and also Swift does too, but Swift is a little bit different. But at least in in Rust, Haskell, and Scala, the default is that you have to, you know, you have to put that question mark at the end to like continue the uh the error up the chain, because otherwise you are stuck with that error if you don't put a question mark. But of course, but then that's built into the type system more, so it's not like you can't accidentally do that because you're going to get that result, but it's it's a little bit different, you know? So in Haskell, it's actually like both of those things, right? <clears throat> like if you're running in a maybe monad, you don't actually have to explicitly pass the thing up the stack. It's just the, the do notation will yeah. take care of all that for you. But at a certain point, you have but to. But you can always oh, break oh, see, out. But then that's why it's like Java, right? Yeah, but, but you can always Java, break so out and then actually, yeah. you know, recognize yeah. that this function is returning to maybe something. 
you know? right so then that's actually scala and scala is the same way with the yeah. four comprehensions yeah. so right <clears throat> so that's a good point so those give you both of them but i guess rust it only gives you you can't transparently do that unless you write it in like a some kind of like point free style in rust then you can get that behavior but um and then everything like except some maybe but um besides for that and then also swift is kind of similar to this right because they have the, like their try it's weird in swift right because swift you have exceptions but then you also have results and you can kind of like transform one into the other right there's like methods to change results into like maybe exceptions and there's a way to turn like tries into maybe results or or optionals or whatever you know yeah there's like it's a try operator in swift instead of it being like a a try block All right yeah it's like in haskell the try um, yeah. function actually turns an exception into a, a maybe right or a, yeah. an either or something okay Some... I think we can stop recording, but yeah. So, 